You know, we're living in a society. <laughs> we're supposed to act in a civilized way. I think about this clip a lot, actually. It's the simplicity that makes it so profound. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. It became such a popular meme a few years ago that Zack Snyder actually included it in the Justice League movie. We live in a society. Even though George's claims about human indecency are refuted moments later when a man passes by and apologizes to George for taking so long. Hey, sorry I took so long. Oh, that's okay, really, don't worry. <laughs> The overall theme of Seinfeld as a show is that people are selfish, vapid, and terrible, especially our four main characters. And when people act in such a way, the consequences are bound to catch up to them eventually. What I find even more fascinating than George's observation, though, is that there's a lot of people who have never even seen this clip, or even had those same thoughts about society. And that really underlines the message here. Even though we are all living in a society, the simple fact that such a society comes with certain rules, which we should obey, has yet to dawn on many of us. What's worse is that those who do recognize that society has rules, well, they don't always believe that those rules apply to them, and they probably wouldn't care to preserve them, even if they did. American culture is not what it used to be. For a lot of people, that may be something to celebrate. They hate the past and pray for progress. Progress towards what, I don't know, and honestly, I'd rather not know. Because if the journey so far is any indication, then what lies at the end of the road will be the stuff of nightmares. In our quest for progress, we have become more media-centric, more divisive, paradoxically relativist in our morality, yet at the same time puritanical. Anything goes, so long as what goes for us goes for you too. And if you disagree, excommunicado. We're more self-centered impatient, uncooperative, untrusting, downright paranoid, and far less empathetic, despite what the astrology girls might say. Rather than accidentally take too long on the phone and apologize afterward, we rudely cut in line and taunt the losers. Why are Americans like this? Let's explore a few theories. One is the exponential advancement of our technology since our nation's founding. Each new generation grows up with technology that is far more advanced than the previous one, and even goes so far as to base much of its culture around said technology. This is a major reason why Zoomers and Boomers, for example, are so vastly different and have such a hard time relating to each other. A comparison of their internet memes might have you believe they're speaking two separate languages. Another explanation is the so-called Enlightenment, which gave rise to philosophies of extreme individualism that began to replace our religion as it was considered antiquated and outdated. Since religion serves as the basis for morality for most people, following social customs becomes less important when the religion is removed from the picture. What incentive is there to act selflessly or respectfully when the rest of your secular peers won't judge you for it and God himself won't judge you for it? Here's a third theory. The previous two developments in technology and philosophy paved the way for globalism. Industries, people, and cultures from across the globe were suddenly capable of intermingling, and secularism helped dismantle the barriers which would have otherwise insulated us from such invasions. Everything was thrown headlong into the melting pot, and our existing culture first became diluted, then overpowered by cultures which were incompatible with the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant behavioral norms of the time. Remember how things used to be? Our shared religion was Christianity. Our ethnic roots were European. As for life experience, most people lived in relative poverty, same as their parents and their parents before them. Processed foods and sedentary lifestyles weren't a problem for our ancestors, which is how they kept so slim and trim, and how men specifically enjoyed the benefits of higher testosterone levels. The dad bod of today would have been considered fat a hundred or more years ago. God knows what they'd think of our obesity problem or our weak and effeminate men. People also dressed nicer. The thought of going out on the town looking like a sack of potatoes was unthinkable and would have been considered distasteful and offensive to others. Communities were smaller and were tight-knit, partially out of tradition and plain old good manners, but also out of necessity. Survival is difficult enough, and it paid to befriend your neighbors. Parenting was authoritative when necessary, but considerably more hands-off than most states will legally permit in today's world. Education in both practical skills and book smarts 
was strongly encouraged because it was seen as the gateway to a better life. Nothing illustrates this point better than Thomas Jefferson's recommended reading list. Check it out and see how many you've read. At most, I've read five of the works he mentioned. Works of literature and music were fewer and harder to come by, so people were more familiar with the same books and songs. Despite harsher lives, people were generally more optimistic about life in general. There were no people using synthesized psychotropic drugs before 1950, and few people used natural psychoactive substances on a regular basis. The common thread? Everyone's life was simpler, more disciplined, more uniform, and more orderly, so the culture was easier to share and understand, and the expectations for how each person should act were more clearly defined. The culture was more practical, and because it had such deep roots, it had better defenses against outside influences. In essence, the lifestyles of our ancestors shaped their views on interpersonal interactions. Thus, people were more likely to, quoting George again, display the slightest sensitivity over the problems of a fellow individual. But consider how things have changed. These days, most people have no religion, or they're just spiritual, or they're the aforementioned astrology girls, or they're one of many Protestant factions, which easily fold under social pressure and embrace the changing culture. Diverse ethnic backgrounds are now the rule rather than the exception. That may not seem like it would affect the broader culture, but consider how one's identity and group preferences are shaped by race. People are more comfortable with those who look like them, and when those who look like each other separate themselves from those who don't, they form their own culture. Over time, that culture spreads, and whichever ethnicity values its own culture the most will eventually dominate the others. Our immense wealth has grown beyond anything our ancestors could have imagined. We live like kings by comparison, yet we show no appreciation for the sacrifices of those who came before us, nor do we try to emulate their way of life. Even though they're the reason we're here, we take our wealth for granted and see them as backward and ignorant, worthy of nothing but apathy and outright hatred. In 21st century America, one-third of us are obese, and two-thirds qualify as overweight or obese. Electric grocery scooters are a common sight. Working from home is becoming more common, and processed foods aren't going anywhere. Treating others with respect requires a certain level of discipline and self-control. But based on the obesity numbers, it's clear that our ability to regulate our behavior leaves much to be desired. We dress like bums most of the time, to be honest. Offices have dropped the business from business casual, and Crocs and Yeezys are everywhere. Communities are dense and sprawling, yet we hardly know our neighbors, and we rarely get to know them due to crippling social anxiety and the ever-present temptation of perfectly curated internet and television entertainment. In our isolation, we lack any true sense of belonging. An odd juxtaposition of helicopter parenting and permissive parenting is the norm. God forbid our children go outside, make mischief, take risks, or expend their nearly limitless supply of energy being physically active and forming friendships with other children. Better to put them in front of a screen all day. It's for their own safety. That way, they'll be completely blindsided by the pain and agony of adult life, crippled by underdeveloped social skills, and their newfound freedom will either tempt them with hedonism or scare them into prolonged childhood. Education is now outsourced to underperforming public schools, which indoctrinate them to hate what remains of their dying culture. Those who don't respect themselves can hardly respect others. Few people read anything after college, and they rarely even watch the same shows. There's just so many channels and too many streaming services, all catered to specific audiences. As recently as 1998, 76 million Americans tuned in to watch the series finale of Seinfeld. These days, only the Super Bowl draws those kinds of numbers, and a lot of people just watch it for the advertisements. Studies show that Americans are increasingly anxious about the future. As the kids say, they're black-pilled. This coincides with much higher use of psychotropic drugs, higher suicide rates, and rampant depression. The common thread. The society in which we live has become too balkanized, and life in general has become too easy for us. This has created an array of incompatible subcultures, each one as selfish as the other, and none of which have been incentivized to respect or find common ground with the others. Life in America is a choose-your-own-adventure story come to life, and we hate it. We listen to our own music at the gym, ignoring everyone else. We do our own work on our own computer, punch the clock, then go home to watch our own shows on TV. We are sharply divided on politics and religion. We want everything quickly, easily, and cheaply, and lack the patience for anything else. 
We go through life at such breakneck speeds that it becomes an inconvenience to stop and consider the perspectives of others. It's no wonder people can't relate to each other as well. And it's this inability to relate to each other which is becoming an enormous problem. In one of the most well-known and beloved episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, episode 102 titled Darmok, Jean-Luc Picard, the captain of the Enterprise, finds himself stranded on a foreign planet alongside an alien named Dathan, who belongs to the Temerian race. Dathan and his people speak in allegories which reference ancient folklore, making it impossible for Picard, who has never read these ancient texts, to understand him. His army with fists closed. With fists closed. That's how you communicate, isn't it? By, by citing example. As they attempt to survive and battle a mysterious beast, Picard relates to the wounded Dathan a condensed excerpt from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which bridges a gap between them. By the end of the episode, Picard begins to understand the context and meaning of Dathan's phrases and uses them to make peace with the rest of the Temerians, avoid the destruction of both ships, and inform them of Dathan's death at the hands of the beast. The episode is brilliant, thought-provoking, and poignant, and as always, Patrick Stewart really sells it. But like the show itself, the optimistic outlook doesn't always correlate with reality. Americans are quickly assuming the roles of Temerians and humans. We are disintegrating into smaller and smaller subcultures. Without a shared knowledge base, without the ability to reference the same material, the same stories, the same experiences, the same joys and sorrows, the same foundational beliefs about God or reality, how can we continue to coexist? Without the deep, interpersonal, and emotional struggles which Picard and Dathan shared on the planet, neither group would have ever come to understand the other, resulting in total annihilation of the ships fighting above. In today's world, there is no space, no opportunity for that deep understanding. There is no wilderness. There is no common threat. At least, not on a scale large enough to compensate for the damage which has already been done. And even if there were such an opportunity, would any of us take it? Why expend the extra mental and physical energy learning to appreciate another subculture when we can expend less effort and gain more temporary enjoyment from sticking to what we already know? The experiences of those from different generations, different racial backgrounds, different genders, and different regions of the country are too far removed from one another, and the effort required to bridge the gaps between them is more than the average American is willing to put in. Some have objected to these arguments. They have conceded George's point that we do indeed live in a society, and we are supposed to act in a civilized way. And they've pointed to things like Coca-Cola, the internet, and Hollywood, football, country music, and the holiday season, and said, you see, America still has a vibrant, unified culture. But these aren't examples of culture. These are examples of consumption. The only unifying cultural institution which remains is consumerism. We've replaced our culture with culture, which is purchased for the price of the newest iPhone or Funko Pop or a ticket to a Lil Nas X concert. American culture and increasingly Western culture is just a smorgasbord of products. Many Americans can't correctly name more than one or two founding fathers, but they know who the Kardashians are. They spend more time Black Friday shopping than they do at church and more time binging Netflix than reading to their children. But what's the point of all this? Yes, we've made some observations about the absolute state of America. But what's the big deal? Societies and cultures change. It's the cost of progress, they say. Oh, there'll be a cost, all right. You just haven't seen the bill yet. But when you do, you may wonder if it was all worth it. So, dear viewer, allow me to reward you for your patience by getting to the point of this video. The point is this. Politics is downstream from culture. We cannot expect to maintain the same freedoms, legal protections, or rule of law we once enjoyed if we continue to act like immature fools. As John Adams famously said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. In my opinion, nothing illustrates this argument better than the story of a man named Sulla. Following the defeat of the Carthaginians in 146 BC, the Roman Republic began to change, and not for the better. The divisions between the two dominant political factions, the Populares and the Optimates, grew larger. 
And when the controversial Gracchus brothers were killed in riots after attempting to reform Italian land distribution policy, political violence became more and more normalized. This, coupled with countless scandals and snafus related to foreign wars, eventually pitted the two factions against each other in a civil war. Enter Sulla. Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix was a Roman general, two-time consul, and optimate political reformer who made his mark on history during a critical transitional period in Rome. His opposition to the populares and the pro-Marian forces ultimately led Sulla to assemble his legions and allies and march them to Rome, where he would claim victory in the Battle of the Colline Gate in 82 BC. This allowed him to assume the role of dictator, at which point he massacred his enemies in Rome in targeted attacks, and reformed Roman law with the intention of restoring the power of the aristocracy and the Senate, and generally returning things to how they used to be. Afterward, he disbanded his legions, surrendered his authority, and retired to his villa to write his memoir, actions which Julius Caesar would later criticize him for, despite the fact that he owed his life to Sulla, who spared young Caesar during the purge. But Sulla's reforms didn't last long. After his death in 78 BC, many of his laws were repealed, and as evidenced by Caesar's civil war a few decades later, his changes did little to strengthen the representative government or prevent the legions from siding with the generals rather than the Senate. In fact, Sulla provided a blueprint for both Caesar and Pompey to seize power for themselves. And all the while, the people of Rome either stood by or actively participated in the mob violence which allowed their republic to fall so easily into the hands of tyrants. One could argue that the collapse of the Soviet Union was America's sack of Carthage. The Gracchus brothers were, of course, Bernie Sanders and AOC. Democrats could be populares and Republicans might be optimates. The messy and expensive foreign wars in North Africa and Asia Minor were similar to our Middle Eastern conflicts. And the political violence which characterized the late Roman Republic is strikingly similar to the type of behavior we've seen in major cities across the country. We're a republic in steep decline, and we should be so lucky to have a Sulla seize power and attempt to right the legal wrongs of the past few decades, as futile as that might be. That would actually be a better deal than the one we'll get. No, what we'll get is a technocratic surveillance state filled to the brim with dazzling entertainment and vicious party politics, all to distract us from any and all critical thinking. That's what we deserve. That's what we've allowed to come into existence. That's what we've apathetically consented to. Sure, why not? It is what it is. What do I care, so long as I'm happy at this very moment? We no longer wait patiently in line to use the payphone. Though we live in a society, we don't care to respect its rules. Without rules, there is chaos. And when faced with the reality of such chaos, people will do almost anything for order, up to and including the surrender of their rights, freedoms, and traditions. When we no longer care to observe our own rules, we will be made to observe someone else's. Thanks for watching.